to and converse with now that you're not in the field and that you're teaching full time? I do speak to other people, uh, not as wide a circle as I did when I was uh, uh, noon of it, for example, when I was working there. It has or shares half of the world's polar bears. So what we were doing in noon of it had a big a big impact on not just Canada, but uh, uh, the whole circumpolar basin uh, uh, populations there. Um, uh, I, I still converse with uh, people who have worked on polar bears uh, in, in universities. Um, I don't. I don't really. I'm not part of the polar bear specialist group anymore. I don't go to the polar bear technical meetings because that's mainly jurisdictional representatives. Um, so the, those contacts are, are not occurring simply because there's no reason to have them. But I still contact uh, some of my old colleagues occasionally, and uh, I'm still working on papers with colleagues uh, that are still active in the field and uh, uh, younger people. Is there anything unique that the polar bears teach us? Well, I don't know that the polar bears are really are really teaching anything. I think they 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 exist without our support. That if we can just if we if we can just like organize our hunting to the point where we don't uh, uh, cause populations to decline, and I think that's that's in pretty good shape, uh, not not just in Canada but around the world. Um, polar bears are pretty good at taking care of themselves. Um, what is going to happen with climate in the future and what impacts that's going to have on polar bears are, are a big question, but we know polar bears have, have persisted throughout uh, some fairly significant climate fluctuations in the past, you know, ice ages and interglacial periods, and uh, some of those were even warmer than, uh, than time, the times are now. But that does not mean that we should sort of just, you know, take it for granted that they can they can handle anything we hand out. I mean, I you know, it's... It's important to respect them, but you know you shouldn't sell them short either. I, I guess I don't really know how to answer that. <laughs> okay. I know it was an unusual question. There's another polar bear expert named Marcus, and I don't know his last name, Dr. Marcus in Canada. Marcus Dick. Yes. Tell, talk about him. Well, he's, I've worked with Marcus. Uh, we've been, uh, he's been involved in the polar bear project already twice in his career in a support capacity. He's now doing his Ph.D. at University of Queens. Uh, very, very hardworking individual. Uh, uh, as with uh, most, uh, most young people, new people, he has some very, uh, very interesting new ideas. Uh, uh, looking at polar bear genetics, looking at polar bear nutrition, polar bear behavior, looking at some uh, alternative techniques for enumeration. Uh, uh, looking at, at tracking polar bears actually by chemical signatures from their foot pads. That's interesting. Um, wow. He's uh, uh, originally from Germany, but a uh, Canadian citizen now, I believe. So, uh, yeah, I know him. I respect his work. He would be good to have on to talk about would, yeah. his work uh, as well with polar bears. In terms of what's next for you now at the university, what are you teaching? Well, I'm in a Department of Geography right now, um, teaching environmental issues, uh, and I'm teaching, in, and last semester I taught Canadian Geography. Uh, this semester I'm adding another course, which is called uh, Nations Within a Nation, looking at uh, uh, Aboriginal political development uh, in Canada. So, uh, social science, natural sciences, I'm actually teaching some uh, uh, under, uh, some undergraduate courses uh, that include climate is one of the things we consider. So, so maybe some of the people who say I can't talk about it will feel better now. <laughs> <laughs> what happens if it gets colder and colder over the next 10 to 15 years? What kind of effect would that have on polar bears, if any? Well, uh, there's some interesting things about greenhouse gases that most people don't really know. One of the things is that if it weren't for greenhouse gases, the temperature on Earth would be about 33 degrees colder centigrade, 33 degrees centigrade colder than it is right now. So that would mean instead of about plus 15 as an average temperature, the average temperature would be like minus 18. Canada would be under a big ice sheet, and uh, uh, people wouldn't probably feel very happy about that. So, you know, having greenhouse gases is, uh, is not necessarily a, a bad thing. Um, we're in an interglacial period right now, um, the, 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 the Pleistocene has been uh, characterized by uh, uh, repeated ice ages, and, and most of the Pleistocene, including, including the, the last little bit of it, has been dominated by ice ages. 
so that a lot of people feel that we're sort of already kind of past due and uh, the climate is likely to cool just because whatever it is that triggers ice ages is kind of overdue to cause another one. Um, the, yeah, the climate is, is, a, is an extremely complex science. Um, the, everything from celestial mechanics to the way heat's distributed by the oceans and the atmosphere, um, the, the, the scale that people have to think and, and work on and take measurements from. Uh, there, there are a number of ideas about you know, what caused ice ages right now, but, uh, and, and we know that it seems to be a North Hemisphere phenomenon. For example, South America's never been glaciated, so the, the Arctic seems to be a key thing in triggering it. It has positive feedbacks there that, that tend to keep a, a warming trend going longer and tend to, uh, tend to keep a, a cold trend uh, in place perhaps longer than, than, than it would otherwise if it was just ever all things equal. But I think the climate science is really a, a very young science, just a developing science. And I think that, you know, in the next 10 or 15 years, uh, new information is going to be developed and uh, new perspectives that are just going to cause our jaw to drop. And, uh, you know, I very much look forward to that so that we can, uh, uh, at least in my little area, which is polar bears, uh, uh, get back to the business at hand. I interviewed uh, Bob Felix who wrote the book Not by Fire but by Ice and Magnetic Reversals and Evolutionary Leaps and he's over at iceagenow.com uh -huh. and he researched a lot of the triggers and factors that have brought us into ice ages and he's convinced that we're on our way to one and of course there's not really a lot of room to hear that right now for most people because every it's kind of like saying up is down, down is up, right is left, left is right, right? But uh, most people can barely hear that the earth has been cooling for the last X number of years because the primary focus and emphasis and impassioned dialogue that's been empowered on the mainstream media channels, both radio and television and print, has been this thing with global warming. So a great deal of the public is not really prepared to hear other information that has to do with factual evidence that the earth is cooling. It makes it very difficult for people to hear that. But anyway, he has substantial evidence, the way he's compiled and put things together. You should take a look at his site. And I think he'd be very interested in your work as well. Looking back sort of in the millions of years now, tens of millions of years as a time frame, the Earth has been, has been in a long-term cooling trend for, for uh, quite a long time. Uh, that's, that's known sort of from a number of proxies. Um, as I say, you know, we're, one could understand the warming that occurred as a recovery from the Little Ice Age. Uh, you know, if you look back, you know, just through the uh, history of uh, human records, there's, uh, there's been climate fluctuations. And, you know, it's, it's climate, climatologists like to get 30 years before they, they talk about trends, um, simply because there are so many, so many things that can, that can affect annual uh, uh, temperatures. Um, so, so I, you know, I think it's because because the demand is for action now. It, it puts a lot of big burden on on the public and on decision makers to really know what to do when there's there's so much ambiguity that's actually out there, and there's so many people insisting that they have it all figured out and they know just what to do. <laughs> I mean, it must make them mad to to read all the conflicting kind of perspectives on things. It's difficult for the public, particularly if you have been fed and fully ingested something as like a state of the world. And you find out that you have to go do your own assessment. You really have to go do your own due diligence and listen and ask the questions and separate the wheat from the chaff. And it's not always easy to do for many people, including myself, who've been very angry at polluters you know, we're the first people to be hooked into the story, to be, you know, brought into the story and then shown the polar bears. And the polar bears are like the the ringleader. They're being used as the ringleaders for the cause. Whose heart wouldn't go out to the polar bears? So, you know, I read in, in Inconvenient Truth and 